Hi, in this video we'll be looking at how to prepare for data model development, design considerations and best practices. Firstly, when doing data model development, you'll need to set up an environment that will allow you to do this. You can see from the diagram here, that we have a Sharpalite application server and it uses data models to talk to the various databases. We also have clients who remotely connect to the application server. If you're setting up a data model environment, you'll need to have an environment that's very similar to an application server where you have data models installed locally and you have local connections to the various systems. Normally what happens is that you develop a data model locally on your PC and once it's ready you deploy to an application server where all the remote clients can then start consuming the data model. In client setup just confirm that you've got local connections to system and the various databases that are required and that you've disabled your remote connection. Once this is done you're ready to start developing data models. I've made a shortcut on my desktop directly to the Shopalite install directory. As a data model developer you most likely want to do the same thing. This shortcut was made on ND applications in the installation bin directory. From here you can see studio. Let's start a new data model. First of all click on file new and the first step is to give your data model a name in this case I'm calling it HR demo usually I'd create a data model over something in Microsoft SQL or MySQL but in this case I'm going to choose Oracle for this to work I need to first install the Oracle drivers the same principle applies to all these other connections one very important point to make here is that the unique code that's associated with the product should not be changed once reports have been generated and deployed on site. The next step is to define the connection to the database. Because I've chosen Oracle, I've got an Oracle connection string. This connection is going to be used in Studio. Later on when we deploy the data model, there'll be, enough, there'll be another set of connection details. Press OK. And next we'll be asked if, if we want to bring in the data model schema. Let's just read the schema as it is at this point. So I'm going to click on get tables and you can see that it's read every schema that was in Oracle. But in this case I'd like to just bring in one schema. I'm going to go back and change the schema details to anything that begins with HR. Shoplite is going to import the tables in the next step and it's going to base the descriptions of the tables and the fields within the tables based on the column names. At this point you have a chance to actually inject user-friendly descriptions for all the tables and fields. Let's explore these options. If I come up to table and views you can see that for this Oracle system we have a SQL statement that's reading in the table details. If we had some sort of data dictionary that provided better names for the tables we could do a join here and supply the correct description for the table. The same principle can be applied to fields as well. So we'd add a join down the bottom here and provide our own description. If the description is not available, it'll be based on the original column name. The next consideration when importing tables is should you import all the tables or just a subset as you progress through the module. I recommend that you import all the tables and views up front because Sharpalite will try to infer the joins between the tables based on the constraints in the database. If you bring the tables in piecemeal then these joins won't be created for the newly added tables. If you're working through a large set of tables in a data model what you can do is just expose a couple of tables initially and hide the rest. I'm going to press OK now and you can see that the tables have now been imported. Up the top in the table view you can see it's automatically organized the table into a folder called HR and down the bottom here we have the full list. So this top view is what the user is going to see. If I double click on countries you can see the table appears here in the middle and here are the column names. Let's customize this view because currently it's showing the unique code for each column and the description. We'd like to see the original SQL name. We come over to Tools, Options and see if we can customize the table labels and field labels. And the same for the fields as well. Let's refresh the list. 
Next I'd like to explain what happens if we do have new tables or columns. I'm going to deliberately delete this table called HR Jobs. And if I come back in and reread the schema, you can see that it's detected the ta missing table and we can re-import it. Now we've re-imported the missing table, you'll notice that the color is slightly different. This is because the table is not displayed anywhere. So I'll need to re-drag it up into a folder so the user can see it. If I was to delete one of these columns, for example, this celery column, and re-import the table, you can see that the schema compare has picked up that there's a missing column, and we can just import that missing column. By default, it'll put it into a special folder, just in case there are multiple columns, and it doesn't quite know where to place it in the visual, in the user display area. Next, I'd like to talk about joins. If I come to the employees table, you'll see that it's missing the joins to the various tables. Let's look at some of the options for creating joins. If I right click and select new join, I could manually create the join to the jobs table by selecting jobs and then marrying up the columns. If the database had constraints, these would have been automatically inferred. I also have the ability to auto detect joins. So I'm coming down to detect join. If there are multiple joins to department throughout the system, I could copy the join, come back, select the column name, and then do a search so that I can place a join wherever we see department ID. So I'm just going to do fine. And over here in special options, you can see that the add join to all tables. This is because we put the join on the clipboard before opening up the search. In this way, we can quickly add bulk joins for our data model. I've added a few more joins, and now I'm ready to try out the data model. Let's save the data model. Always save the data model to the default location. Also, you may be prompted to shut down Excel or a service. This is because when the new data model is detected, it's going to be compiled and we can't have it locked by other services or Excel. Because it's the first time that we've saved this data model, it's thrown us into the connection window where we can define the connection for the database. Studio has its own connection separate from the deployment connection. Save the connection details and next come up to Query Builder. I'm going to do some quick queries over the system that we've just created. From the product list, select your new data model and you can see that the, currently the tables are still under this arbitrary folder. We can reorganize the tables later and hide tables that are still incomplete. Also, we can fix up these descriptions by using global search and replace. Let's have a look at the employees table. If I bring out the employee ID, first name, last name, and then come into the jobs table, I can find out what their job type and if we preview the data and come down here to information, SQL statement, you can see that the SQL statement's been automatically built up by the engine, depending on our selection. Because we chose some columns out of jobs, it's automatically introduced the join to jobs, which just brings us to the topic of views. Usually the decision to use a view or not will be based on performance and also the complexity of the view. Let's have a look at a view in this particular system. You can see in this Oracle database we have our tables and then we have our view. And if we have a look at the contents of the view, it's simply combining a number of joins to locations, countries, jobs. Nothing that we couldn't have got if we had gone directly to the tables and followed the joins. For this reason, I'm coming to the view in the data model and I can delete the view or I can set it to visible equals false so that if at a later date I do want to use the view, I can reintroduce it. Next, let's have a look at some of these descriptions. What I'd like to do is remove HR space from the front of all these table descriptions. I'll come into search and I'm going to search for HR space and from the options here I can choose the items to target. So I'm going to look for tables and their descriptions 
and I do a fine. Let's come up to replace with and we'll replace it with nothing. When making changes to data models, there are a few things that you need to be careful of. For example, if we produced a report over the employees table, the report will be using these unique codes for the table and also for the columns. If we change these codes, then we'd break the existing report. We can change the column details or add new information and that won't affect any existing reports. It's just the changing of these codes that'll break the reports. If you want to change the code, do it in the early stages before you've deployed any report. Next, let's focus on mandatory fields and lookups. Here's another data model where I have a ledger and a chart of accounts. Let's have a look at the ledger table. You can see up the top here we have some blue columns. These columns have been set as mandatory. The reason this has been done is that there may be a huge number of transactions in the ledger. So to prevent the user from selecting all the transactions when producing a new report, we've stipulated that the period in the account code and the ledger source are mandatory and need to be entered. Usually mandatory filters will be on some of the primary keys in that table. In this way, we can prevent them from hitting everything in the system. We can also default mandatory filters to a particular value. So in this case, you can see the period and I can default the period to be the current period by coming down to default value. Now let's have a look at how the lookups are defined. To override the select distinct from ledger behavior, come down to the lookup and have a look at the options and select the lookup definition menu. You can see that this particular lookup for account is inheriting the lookup on the chart of accounts. In this way, the lookup is driven from the chart of accounts instead of the ledger. As regards to the amount, it's not really appropriate to have a lookup that's based on a select distinct from the ledger. So for that reason, I would like to come down to the lookup and disable it. So we'll set this to none. Next, I'd like to talk about testing. If we had a mistake in the data model, for example, a SQL error, I'm just going to deliberately type in a mistake here. Come into Tools and select Query Tester. Query Tester will allow you to test every permutation in the data model before deploying to site. And wherever there's an error, it'll give us the details of, of the SQL error. If you have made changes to a data model and find that those changes need to be rolled back, you can come over to File and Restore Backup. Now let's have a look at some of the product attributes. So I'm select product down the bottom and come to attributes. You can see here we can set the database description and the license type, the author details, and also the change history and the version number. Most data model development will be done under the license type custom. This doesn't require any registration of your data model, but if you're going to deploy your data model with various clients and wish to tie a license key into your data model, then you'll need to change its license type to distributed. In closing, I'd just like to discuss localization. Data models can have a dictionary, and the dictionary will be based on all the common labels within that system. For example, I can come over to Special Actions and turn every label that I've currently got in the system into a dictionary key. And then I can come over to Special Actions and then create keys based on them. It's created 36 keys. And then from here, we can come to the localization options, like select language. And if I wanted to translate it into Japanese, for example, I can select Japanese and then come down and auto translate. If you don't have your own ID, just select OK. And you can see now the labels have been localized into Japanese. This is an auto translate, so of course you'll need to go through the labels and just check them for accuracy. In conclusion, the most important detail about data model development is not to change any of the codes that are behind the tables or columns. You can see this report here has the SQL, and below that we have the XML, which is the definition for the report. And all the codes that are used are based on the data model codes. So we can change the underlying SQL but we shouldn't change any of the codes. This concludes how to plan for a data model and some of the best practices that are involved.